what's going on. I mean, I've, I've got some very dark thoughts on this. Well, yeah. Uh, so Star Wars episode four, five, and six were really good. There's a point to this, yeah? Uh, as, by the way, is Mandalorian Boba Fett, because it captures the original feel of episodes four, five, and six, and Rogue One. I forgive these remakes because they still capture the feel of episode four, five, and six, which were the originals, made in 1977. But one, two, and three, with Jar Jar Binks, were a bit weird for me. Yeah. But really important to understand, by way of analogy, for the young kids today, many of you here are young people in the audience, you can see, yeah? By way of analogy, to see what's going on. So let's talk through this analogy, because it sounds a bit less crazy when you're telling it as fiction. But we know reality is stranger than fiction. So who remembers, if you've seen the films, when Senator, then Senator Palpatine, uses an emergency. Exactly, right? Klaus Schwab. So he uses an emergency within Parliament to institute an emergency law to take over because there's a foreign threat. By then he becomes Emperor Palpatine, yeah? And it's all done from within. In political theory, that's called a palace coup. Especially if it's bloodless and done in that way from the inside, that's called a palace coup. It doesn't have to involve palaces. A lot of people got confused when I used that term. I didn't mean the Queen has <laughs> orchestrated a coup against well, the rest she of might. the world. She might. Well, you know, <laughs> what I mean is a bloodless coup. That's the palace coup, yeah? As opposed to a military coup, which is what we were trying to do when we were trying to overthrow the Egyptian government. But a palace coup doesn't require arms and guns, it requires deceiving people into thinking there's an emergency so that they can institute an emergency law and then never rescind it. Or at least never rescind the parts of it that really give you power and pretend to rescind the rest. So follow that analogy and we see emergency after emergency being used and there are people like Blair waiting in there for, for that opportunity. And I know Tony Blair, I've met him many times, spoken to him, you know, it's not that it's not that these people are, they're not a caricature sitting in some dark corner with a cloak on waiting to stab you in the back. These are people that operate openly and tell you what they want to do. Klaus Schwab, somebody mentioned, he tells you that his young global leaders have penetrated over half of the cabinet in Canada and then he named Macron and he named a whole bunch of other people. This is the palace coup in answer to your question. Right? There is a network of people in, in my world and in the work that we used to do as political uh, activists, this is called entryism, right? Entryism. In political theory, that's the long march. That, right. Yep. Gramsci spoke about... What's going on? This is a long march through our institutions by a network of ideologues who are actually fascists, who are working within our state, within our governments, and I use those two terms because they're not the same, within our state and within our governments, because even when you change government, the state remains, and there are a lot of these networks in the state itself. And they're working to slowly subvert democracy and liberty. So instead, they can bring about technocracy. And technocracy, in a nutshell, is authoritarianism governed by AI. Yeah? So, that's what I believe is going on. Now, people might say, what's the evidence for that? But actually, it's amazing, because the last terrible years we just had with COVID, one of the silver linings for what just happened to us is that as, back to the Star Wars analogy, as Palpatine did when he felt that he could get away with it, is he called himself an emperor and he came out of the shadows and everything came out in the open. They overplay their hand when they think they're winning. That's a very common trait for ideologues. And the reason, arrogance, the reason why that happens is, is right down to why, what happens when you believe in an ideology, in dogma. When you adopt a dogma, an ideology with which you're seeking to change reality, yeah? So think, for example, communists who believe in dialectical materialism, that change only occurs when you encourage conflict.
through, through the Hegelian dialect, yeah? And you encourage that conflict, exploit that conflict and the, and, the, and the unease that comes and then bring a solution. See, you're working to certain ideological dogma about what reality looks like through a lens of ideas you've adopted, this idealism that you have for the future. It's why most of those types of people usually become tyrants, because they're blind to reality. They're thinking just in terms of their dogma. There's a weak spot there, huge weakness. When dogma defines your behavior, you're no longer looking at reality to define your behavior. So you're going to be less pragmatic and more dogmatic because you're led by ideology and dogma. That leaves serious blind spots. You end up not seeing reality for what it is. And that's why they overplay their hand because they're not looking to reality, they're looking to their dream, right? Their ideal, which is actually a nightmare. So there's one great thing that happened over COVID, and that is they overplayed their hand, and they exposed themselves to everybody here in this room. Yeah? There's now... There's now very little doubt among people that have heard of the World Economic Forum that it's attempting to influence how we do government and politics in this country, even though Klaus Schwab isn't British, right? Why do we have an unelected bureaucrat and a foreign one at that, yeah, telling us how to live our lives in Britain? It doesn't make sense. But then you go further. Why do they all appear to be beholden to this unelected foreign bureaucrat? Why do they all appear to be doing this man's bidding? And when you start thinking of things in that way, and you think, why can't they just say no and start digging a bit more, you then realize what Epstein's black book was about. They can't say no, because there are, they talk about compromat, compromising material and information, political blackmail, or you then get Epstein if you don't agree, suicided, it becomes that's when you start realizing that this is a global palace coup. And all the means that people would have at their disposal to force another human being to do their bidding, they've been using. Blackmail, corruption, threats, uh, uh, violence, um, uh, gaslighting, propaganda, everything you can think of. Now think of the last time a state did that and what kind of state that was. Which state relied on propaganda, murder, violence? Exactly. Then start joining the dots and look up Operation Paperclip and understand what happened to the Nazis who lost the war in World War II and where did they go and who took them in? The CIA took them in under a code name Operation Paperclip because they needed their science and they wanted their space program and they wanted their missiles. When you understand this, this is all basic, basic history at the moment. This is this part that I'm about to say is now opinion. Nothing I just said, Operation Paperclip is real, right? This is opinion, and I'm always open with people when I'm giving them my opinion, so they understand when I'm speaking about just facts. Operation Paperclip is a fact. A lot of those Nazis resettled in South America, some were taken by the CIA to work on secret, secret programs. This part is opinion. And as a result, Nazism never died, right? Yeah. And I don't mean, I don't mean neo-Nazism. Neo-Nazism was a kind of thug I was running away from as a 15-year-old, right? They called themselves Combat 18. I mean actual Nazism, actual Nazism, not neo-Nazism the continuation of Nazism as we know it and study it in history. Eugenics, using science and experiments on human beings to try and manipulate and engineer reality, social engineering, right? These are all totalitarian concepts, Nazi concepts, and they suddenly found a resurgence in our, in our day and age, right? And then you start understanding, and you start understanding why is it that there happens to, at the same time that there's a confluence between authoritarianism, technocracy, using science and experts to abuse humans, right? And you realize, why is it all of a sudden that actual armed Nazis have reemerged in Ukraine? We're funding them, we're arming them, nobody's calling it out, 
right? And before the war, everybody, including the Daily Beast and the Atlantic and the Independent and the Guardian, everybody, including, in other words, the left, were calling Azov Nazis, they suddenly stopped calling them Nazis the minute the war started, right? Now, by the way, by the way, this part is also a fact, but even if you were a bit doubtful about the fact that Azov are Nazis, understand this. I founded the world's first counter-extremism organization called Quilliam in 2008 in London. Under that banner, I've advised presidents and prime ministers. I've met George Bush, I've met Tony Blair more times than I can think of. I advised Cameron in office. In fact, when Cameron called the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood to come to Downing Street when uh, Mubarak was overthrown, they sent their spokesperson of the regime that was elected after the overthrow of Mubarak. The Muslim Brotherhood spokesperson was unfortunately named Jihad. But anyway, <laughs> let's, let's ignore that part. In, in the Egyptian accent, you say Gihad because the J is a G. So let's call him Gihad. Gihad al-Haddad was brought to Downing Street as the official Egyptian representative. Cameron brought me there to help formulate Britain's policy towards this new Egyptian government. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because I know extremism. For 10 years or 12 years, the world's prime ministers and presidents were calling upon me to help them understand extremism. So even if you don't want to believe The Guardian, even if you don't want to believe The Guardian and The Atlantic and all these other liberal papers and left newspapers that before the war were calling as of Nazis, I've documented all of this on my sub, sub stack with all the links and all the receipts. Even if you don't want to believe them, believe the guy that presidents and prime ministers were calling upon to understand extremism. When I sit here today and say to you, as of are Nazis, just like ISIS are extremists, right? Then you have to ask, why is that being concealed deliberately? And then I bring you back to the Global Palace coup, to Klaus Schwab, to penetrating cabinets, and we've got to understand that just as Chamberlain was appeasing Nazism, and it took a Churchill to come along and kick some sense into everybody, we're in a moment now where Nazism is being appeased and our governments and our states that exist beyond the governments are being infiltrated by authoritarian extremists who have an ideology and they're using psychological means, propaganda and gaslighting as we witness through COVID to pull the wall over all of our eyes so that like the proverbial frog that, frog that is boiled in water, we don't realize that we're being bored alive. And we've got to speak out openly, frankly, and candidly, without pulling any punches, to call out Nazism where we see it. Yeah? <clears throat> Last thing I'll say on this. Last thing I'll say on this is, some people say, but Maggie, what do you do? Russia invaded Ukraine. Well, who else are we going to fund? I say, all right, okay, fine, okay. So that's like saying that Russia was in Syria, let's fund ISIS. Because ISIS was against Russia in Syria as well. Now, if you're not going to do that, but you're going to fund Nazis, I can tell you ISIS killed a lot of people. But with my professional extremism hat on now, Nazis have killed a heck of a lot more people than ISIS did. Right? So if you're okay with us funding Nazis, and you're not okay with us funding ISIS, if you're okay with stripping Shamima Begum's citizenship because as a 15-year-old, she went to join, marry a man who joined ISIS, not even fight herself, but as a 15-year-old, she went to marry a man who joined ISIS. And you're okay with stripping her passport, but we're clapping and sending people out to fight with Nazis in Ukraine, and we're not even not stripping them of their passports. We're actually encouraging them with adverts and PR campaigns. Go and join as of the Nazis. Then you wonder why Muslims are angry and get radicalized. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a problem here. There's only one solution to that. And that one solution is, I need to criticize ISIS and Nazism. It's not either or. Yeah? We can be against both. We can be against Assad in Syria and Putin as well as ISIS in Syria. We can be against what Putin's doing in Russia 
and against the Azov Nazis in Russia, in Ukraine, and also, I am, I don't know about you guys, against that corrupt thief that is Zelensky. Right? Yeah, yeah.